A new caucus, Democratic Socialists of America, are applauding endorsements of Senator Bernie Sanders by Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar. In an official statement, the group called the show of support a watershed moment, saying in part, backed by a diverse, energetic working class movement, Bernie Sanders can win the nomination, beat Donald Trump, and together we can transform politics in this country. So actor and YouTuber Oliver Thorne, he's a supporter of the movement. He shared his video, which he calls a guided meditation on peace, presentation, political revolution. When we think of the revolution as a specific event, like an armed uprising that will take place in the future, we can become concerned about whether our actions take us closer to our idea of that event or farther away. We may become fixated on the purity of our vision, focusing only on the ideal, classless future and neglecting other forms of oppression that others struggle against in the here and now. He joins us now to talk about why he made this video and his thoughts on democratic socialism writ large. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it, man. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You didn't tell me you were going to embarrass me by showing a clip. Oh, Here's your publicly available video. It's available. <laughs> it's, available. <laughs> it's all on YouTube, man. We're fans, Oliver. I know. Don't worry. <laughs> so, Oliver, thank tell you. us, why, why did you decide to make the video? Um, it was partly, uh, partly for fun. Um, <laughs> so the, so the video is called, uh, Reform or Revolution, an ASMR guided meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I noticed, uh, the ways people talk about, so my, my show Philosophy Tube, um, I teach philosophy in a fun, interesting way. Um, and I noticed that the way people talk about the idea of revolution, both on the right and the left has some interesting assumptions behind it. Um, and so I decided to dive into those assumptions. And I thought one of the most fun ways of doing that would be to do it as a as a kind of joke uh, guided meditation. <laughs> Partly because when people talk about revolution, they get they get very very angry, they get very head up. So I thought, okay, let's have something calming, have something nice. And there's some interesting kind of relations to time in the way people talk about revolution too. And I thought there was there's something nice about like meditation and mindfulness and being present, which is a nice contrast to that. So it was kind of half a joke and half serious. Yeah, yeah which, good. which like it's hard when you just take a clip of it right out of context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What, but what are, I mean, talk a little bit about the, the material that you cover in the video. What are some of those assumptions on the right and the left, and how do they differ when they think about um, revolution? Uh, well, people do uh, imagine the revolution, I think, as an event, um, as some sort of future thing. Uh, whereas the idea of it being something that we can do in the here and now is is potentially a bit of a contrast to that um the idea that it's something that we can that we can work on in the present um i think people can uh sometimes i don't know if people people use the word revolution in different ways and i think sometimes people can use it to mean only small steps when it is supposed to be this this break with what has come before um so there are adverts on the tube in london of like join the housing revolution and it's it's not, and I see those and I'm like oh wow we're gonna get rid of landlords and it's like no it's just like a bigger landlord. And so, okay. <laughs> right. No, we're just like selling you a credit card or something. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it's like actually we're just giving you a lease on credit at ninety percent interest. Right. But that's, uh, that's but it's revolutionary. That they think there's an appetite. I think it's an appetite for revolution that they can sell and use in marketing, which is yeah. quite telling. That that yeah. is that, so. Let's get into that. Which is what is it? I mean, look, you know, transatlantic relations. I actually think our 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 cultures are so similar, just given you know what's bubbling underneath and the surfaces of both. What do you think is that feeds that appetite, particularly amongst people who are younger? Um, I can't speak for everyone of, mm. of my age. I'm, I'm 26, although I know I don't look it. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of people in my country have, have no hope of owning property um, and, uh, and still have a strong desire to. And, and some are ready to sort of let go of the idea that maybe that's something we need to do and, uh, and perhaps move towards a different system. Um, but a lot of people, certainly of my age, all, all we have facing us is climate death and debt. And, and so the, the system now is not really working for the majority of people. And of course, throughout history, it hasn't worked for the majority of people on the planet. Um, and now it's working for, for an even smaller, smaller minority. Um, so I think now people are, are open to the idea that philosophy is back. You know, for the longest time, people yeah. thought, oh, philosophy's dead, it's not relevant. But actually, no, um, there's, there's never been a better time to study it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's well said, and I, I think that explains a big part of the success and the audience that you've found, is people are really trying to grapple with the nature of what we're doing here. They're looking for footing and maybe philosophies of the past, bigger ideas and radical ways of changing the present. Is that? Do you think that that's part of why people are, have really gravitated towards the videos you put up? 
Oh, oh maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I don't know. I think people people like the space that I create, and, and I hope they find the videos entertaining and, and fun and different. Um, I think partly people are hungry for new ideas, and people people say things like, you know, philosophy is not relevant to everybody's everyday life. And, and I think for a long time throughout history, that was kind of true, because it was mainly written by um, academics from, from very privileged backgrounds and who ignored a lot of other voices. Um, but an example that I'm working on at the moment is... Um, if you hear a concept of like Miranda Fricker's idea of epistemic injustice, sounds very, very complicated. It sounds like, oh God, I'd never understand that. If you understand the Me Too movement, you can understand Miranda Fricker's epistemic injustice. And if you understand Fricker, then you can understand Me Too. And if you understand them both, then you can kind of see how they play off each other and you get a richer experience of both. So that's what I try and do with my show is say, hey, look, these are some ideas that you've like maybe even been aware of but haven't put words to that can maybe explain some of what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's for look. We're a political show, and and I think one of the one of the most interesting things that I found with your channel and and with other, I, I find you part of that whole you know the cerebral YouTube is that you have really found the way to connect what it is a deep feeling within our politics to ideas that have kind of been relegated by others because we don't really think through what our political system is. Have you have you found like how do you see the intersection between politics explicitly? and some of the philosophy that you that you look at on your channel well i try not to be too didactic politically right. on the show um in fact i do i do get a lot of people who think that i'm of one particular political persuasion or another there's there's like a lot of um there's a lot of disagreement of like, what exactly like who would i vote for for instance mm -hmm. um which well, i like us. i deliberately who, try you, who do you vote no, for yeah. absolutely i'm not saying right. no, my, my job on the record, my job right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> My job requires a certain yeah. certain degree of ambiguity, um, which is deliberate. But uh, I think people are people are hungry for it. People do want to think about it. Um, and certainly in my country, I, I don't quite know um, US media quite so well. Certainly in my country, there's a sort of a default uh, language and a default style of thinking about politics, which is starting to break up. But uh, and, and that kind of rests on a default assumptions about what sorts of things are valuable. And I think a lot of people are, are willing to now think, well, actually, do I value that? And am I willing to engage with this? And what else is out there for me? And how can I start taking a little bit of control over the ideas that I'm fed and, and think about how they fit together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really true. I mean, look, we just started posting this show, political show, to YouTube a few months ago. And the growth has been phenomenal, I think, in part because we do have that same sort of standardization of media and the way that politics are talked about. And so the fact that we've done it a little bit differently, um, people have really gravitated towards that. Mm -hmm. But you know, you first came on my radar um, with your video, Men Abuse Trauma, which um, was just, I mean, first of all, I applaud you, but it was a, it's a true work of art. Everyone should watch it. It's beautifully done. It's powerful. It's provocative. It is also an incredible feat because you've memorized the whole, like, 35-minute script. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's all, it's all one take. Un I mean, unreal. Like, I just can't even wrap my head around that. But could you talk about um, the inspiration for that video and also what the response to it has been? Sure. Um, well, uh, the, for those uh, viewers who haven't seen it, I made a video called Men Abuse Trauma, um, which is a, kind of about the philosophy of mind but also about abusive relationships and also about some of my own experiences with an abusive relationship. And that's the sort of thing I do typically on the show is I'll take a philosophical idea and make it about society and make it a personal so there's a bit of a, a personal connection for you. Um, so I made this video, which is all one take. It's a 35 minute monologue. Um, uh, I, I went to drama school and, and trained as an actor. So so I, I, it's just the sort of thing I like to do <laughs> for fun is memorize 35 minute speeches. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's all based on a play by Jean-Paul Sartre called No Exit. Um, Sartre was a philosopher and a playwright. Um, so there's kind of precedent for combining these two things. And it's about the philosophy of mind and, and how ideas from outside can, can take hold in your brain and, and what, it, what it really means to think critically, I guess, about uh, your own life, what it really means to do philosophy and realize that it has profound implications for you as a person and for the way you live your life. Mm -hmm. um, I realize that it's all, it's all very vague and, uh, and, and mashed up, but you just have to watch it. <laughs> no, yeah. Every, oh, we encourage everybody to go and watch it. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. We really enjoy talking to you. Thank My you. Pleasure. Come back again, thank please. You very much. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Coming up, according to a Gallup survey, an estimated $88 billion is borrowed every year by Americans to cover health care costs. How did the system get so broken? Public health expert Dr. Abdul El-Sayed, he gives us his take when Rising continues.